Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. And welcome to Nautel's webinar on making HD radio deployments easier and more affordable. I'm Chuck Kelly with Nautel, and I'm joined by the very knowledgeable and experienced Philip Schmidt. Philip, yes, welcome. Hello. hello, hello. Nice to have you with us today. This is going to be fun. We're, we're going to talk about where HD radio has come in the last dozen years or so. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, the HD radio deployments today. We're going to introduce some new products. We're going to talk about a new HD upgrade path for the NV Light series. But we're going to have a quick taste of our webinar from two weeks from now, uh, HD SFNs. And then we're going to take your questions. And to that point, all of the attendees uh, that are online, you can ask questions. You can type your questions in on the GoToWebinar application. And at the end of the broadcast, Phil and I will do our very best to answer all of your questions. So let's go right on. Phil, this is a very telling graph of, of growth in HD. Well, exactly. Uh, the very first thing to maybe highlight here is you know, sort of the timeline going from about 2003 to today. Uh, you know, this, this whole HD radio conversion has been going on for some time, as, as most of you will be aware, of course. Um, but, you know, starting in 2003 with a few experimental installations. Then sort of the, the first big build-out happened in 2005 to 2006. You can see that in the top line here, which is the total number of FM stations that have converted to HD in the U.S. only. So the first build-out, 2005, 2006, and, you know, sort of steady climb to about 2010. And uh, we see set things settling out a little bit at, at 2010 in terms of total, total station conversion. Uh, but as of, you know, the last couple of years, we see a nice little uptick again in more stations converting to HD. Um, but the more interesting thing to look at in this particular graph and more applicable to our talk today is the number of secondaries that are being built out. So the second curve underneath the total conversions, um, the gray line, are all the secondaries added together. So all the HD2, 3, and 4s added together. And the interesting thing to see there is even though that maybe the total number of station conversions have, have, has a little bit plateaued, there's still a very strong increase in building out more secondary content. So some stations, or many stations, have HD2 channels. Of those, some of them have HD3 channels, shown in the curves below. And a few have HD4s. Um, certainly not everybody has secondaries today, but those that have secondaries oftentimes will have multiple secondaries. So if you uh, click there. Exactly. So today we have over 2,400 stations converted that now also includes the AMs. Uh, and more importantly, we have 40 million receivers in the field. So that was we, really the thing that was slowing HD radio down for so many years as the receivers, but 40 million is a significant number. Well, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, the interesting thing now is that uh, if you look at the total number of side channels, it pretty much equals the number of FM channels. So in other words, we've pretty much doubled the listening choice to, to listeners you know, on those stations. They now have twice as much audio content to listen to. And you know, partly, we, or for a large degree, we have to contribute the success to the number of um, automobile manufacturers that are shipping H radio receiver standard. In 2015, it was about 37% of all cars, uh, and with an increasing uh, percentage uh, thereon. Um, like Chuck, there we go. Um, and even if you look today, these numbers are a little bit old already, as in to end of 2015. Uh, but you can see the number of listening choices in, let's say, New York. You have 122 HD radio channels, uh, which is uh, a big step up from you know a decade or two decades ago. A couple um, of things come to mind to me, Phil. The first is when you have two million receivers in Los Angeles. It explains why stations are, that are secondary channels, that is, they cannot be heard with an existing analog station um, or analog receiver, um, actually are starting to show up in the, in the ratings. You have two million receivers out there in, in a market, in a city. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is this is all talking about the United States, but HD radio is now on the air in Mexico and in Canada, and the supply of new cars that comes into the United States is very similar to what's being shipped to Canada and to Mexico. So many of the cars being imported into Canada and Mexico today uh, and being manufactured in Canada and Mexico today are equipped with HD radio. And, and so 
as Canada and Mexico begin to continue to build out their HD radio systems, they're going to have a big advantage in, in the number of receivers that are already in the marketplace. Well, exactly. And especially you will see it will be a much faster conversion in those countries because they've already got this installed receiver base. So I don't expect it to take 10 years in Mexico and Canada. It will be much, much faster. Yep. So HD and, and hybrid FM is, 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 is really on its way. And we doubled the number of audio services to the listener. So let's talk about the history of HD radio. In the battle days, if you will, 10, 15 years ago, um, a station would take and modify their existing transmitter, and it may be a solid state rig or it could be a tube rig, and, and typically you got about 30% of your nameplate power if you converted to HD plus, uh, plus analog. And the efficiency of the transmitter when it was shifted from Class C into Class AB reduced significantly to 30 to 40 percent total efficiency, which of course meant you had high waste heat and you had complicated first generation components. Um, to call it a science project might be a little bit uh, kind actually, uh, but there was also very sophisticated and complex combined systems. So you look over here on the right, the high power combined system. Now the way that worked was you had a specialized combiner here, the analog signal 10% of that went into this reject load all the time. And of the digital signal, 90% went into the reject load at all times. And that was assuming a minus 20 dB injection level. So it was a very lossy system. And those reject loads, let alone the efficiency hit on the digital transmitter, you also had a lot of heat created in that reject load. And there was a little the instrumentation, a broadcast engineer, could configure it. It looks like it's working okay, but there really wasn't an easy way to tell if it was working up to snuff. And uh, so that was a problem. And there were building penetration issues at the at the uh, minus 20 dB injection level. It's not that the HD signal didn't penetrate the building. The problem was that the signal-to-noise performance in a building is worse because of all of the unintended radiators, computers and lights and all those kinds of things inside a building. And they did deteriorated, detracted from the coverage of the weaker HD signal. So uh, that was a problem. And because there were very few receivers, it follows that there were few listeners. And the magic of what, it, of what has happened in the last 10 years or so is that we're now up to about 100% of nameplate power and current produced transmitters, even in low-level combined. Up to 50 to 70% efficiency in uh, transmitters. Uh, very manageable waste heat. The, the topology of high-level combined and those things has become uh, much less because it's so much simpler to do a low-level combined system. We're up to third and fourth generation components. Low-level combined is super simple. We've built test equipment into the transmitters like the MER measurement tool, the Constellation View. And because the FCC has implemented up to 10 DBC injection, minus 10 injection level, um, the building penetration issue is much easier, and we've got the, uh, if you have a, an adjacent channel, you can actually, the technology allows you to have asymmetrical um, uh, sideband levels on, the, on either the other side of your carrier, and the 40 million receivers in the marketplace is probably the biggest factor as to what's changed today and why we're at critical mass. So, Phil, what, how did we get to this point? Right. Along the way, um, the industry certainly recognized that, you know, the, the, those early days were, were pretty challenging to set up and whatnot. And um, um, in 2008, we already recognized that something needed to be done. So there was an NAB fast road project, the embedded exporter project, that sort of took the first step of, of simplifying the HD radio conversion and also reduce the equipment cost by doing so. Nautel's answer to this was the exporter plus, shown below. And uh, it, it was very much focused on the main HD, the HD1, um, and it would interface an, exp an importer for HD2, 3, and 4, and all the other data applications. And also deals with some of the FM literacy delay and ramping for live coverage, and it takes care of program data service. So that was sort of the first step along the way, and uh, it's been a very successful product for Nautel. Um, we've had it for a while, and we'll continue to have that for some time to come. Um, there, you know, there's no reason to, uh, um, it's still very, it fits the market very well. Um, so despite some of the things we're saying today, this is a product that will continue. 
and it still has very good application. It's so interesting. It's, it's interesting that uh, that product is actually nine years old, or coming up, coming up to be nine years old, and uh, and yet it's still working so well in the marketplace. Exactly. Exactly. And it will continue to do so. So what is new today is that we're introducing a new HD radio importer. Um, and uh, so essentially it's a two rack unit uh, box um, that takes care of the HD2, 3, 4 audio capture and all the program service data. And with its external automation support, we can do RS experience, station logo, and various data services. And the exporter, of course, as I've already mentioned, that's the HD1 side of things, and it has integrated GPS time base. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the upcoming slides. And it deals with the FM audio capture and diversity delay. What is different today is we've been able to move the exporter function right into the uh, importer as such. So that is part of the fourth generation HD radio system architecture that allows us to do that. So now this one box can fulfill both functions. And what's really cool about this, as far as I'm concerned, seeing how much difficulty many broadcast engineers had installing HD radio in the past, is the simplicity that this brings to an HD radio installation for the, for the field engineers. Yeah, and plus the, the flexibility that we'll get into as well. So we can tailor this to whatever your needs are. Let alone the fact that it is significantly less, less expensive. Exactly. So let's look, let's look inside. Walk us through it, Phil. Well, like I said, the integrated GPS receiver is sort of the, uh, it's a very key component of the entire system. It's the heartbeat. So we, Noctel designed our own uh, GPS card that we can install into the system. It's a, a PCI card. Um, it's got a little GPS module on it. Uh, the important thing is that GPS module gives us a one pulse per second that creates the uh, proper time heartbeat. It drives a 10 megahertz crystal oscillator uh, that's oven ice, so it, it always operates at a constant temperature, and it has a very good uh, holdover specifications and frequency tolerance and and, uh, and such. And um, it also drives a 44.1 kilohertz word clock that is then connected on the uh, Lynx audio card on the left-hand side there and drives its word clock. So therefore, we've managed to simplify to integrate the uh, or discipline the audio rates to our GPS. We also supply the unit with an outdoor, uh, ruggedized outdoor antenna shown on the left, looks like a little mushroom there, uh, along with feed line and whatnot. And we have a monitor application that shows you the amount, the number of satellites, uh, the uh, precision that uh, we've calculated, your longitude and latitude, as well as the time. It gives you a little bit of uh, confidence that everything's hooked up right and that you've got good frequency lock. The other important part is the audio capture card. So we've used the uh, Lynx AES-16E PCI Express card, uh, which sits right beside the GPS module. And you can see that there is a little ribbon cable that in connects, interconnects the two, or there's a little cable that connects the, the word clock. Um, and it drives up to eight separate converters on that clock. And I'll show you, give you a more detailed view later when we actually look at the, the actual system. But that just gives you a little bit of a preview here. We also have optional redundant uh, hot solvable power supplies that uh, uh, can be an option. And we've also built in um, a sixth generation i5 processor that gives us plenty of headroom. Um, you know, right now it runs about 7% CPU with four HD channels, so there's lots of headroom for future applications. And as uh, you know, the industry is coming up with more innovative solutions and whatnot, well, this box is ready for it. I think it's important to mention that as a manufacturer, Phil, we, we constantly try to design our products with as much headroom as possible. And, and I think the fact that the exporter is still in use you know, nine years later is proof that we're, we're, uh, we've done our job. But, but over time, as we add features and as we change things and, and improve things, the, the usage of that PC can, in, increases. And it, eventually, you run out of headroom. And what we've done here is to vastly increase the amount of headroom in the system. Exactly. Okay. For those of you that are familiar with the uh, original importer applications, uh, here's the new control panel for the uh, importer and combined exporter set, uh, setup. Looks a little bit different than before, um, but it gives you much of the same configurations. I won't delve into a lot of detail here because, again, we'll have a look at the actual running system there in a minute. 
and uh, it allows you to configure your service modes, configure your bandwidth allocations, set up your audio clients, and the current software version will be 5.04. Okay. Let's continue on. There you are. It also comes with a new web interface, so if you want to remote control the system, um, you know, you can just point it to a web browser at the IP address of the unit, and that provides you with a little login. Um, now, certainly, if you run this over an unsecured network or the internet, make sure that you have sufficient security provisions for that, um, so you don't get hacked. But uh, certainly, we have a basic security precautions in place. Does it require Flash? He had to ask. No, no, it does not require Flash. It's HTML based. Excellent. All right. Um, Nautil Rob HE Transport was a protocol that uh, Nautil has uh, devised a few years back. It goes back to about the 2006-2007 time frame. And this particular uh, protocol takes the communication path from the exporter to the exciter and makes it more robust, makes it reliable. It allows for retransmissions if there's lost packets. It smooths out any of the bandwidth that's required on that link between this particular piece of equipment and the, uh, the exciter. And where previously you might have needed somewhere in the order of 1.5 megabits, now you have a consistent bandwidth around below 300 kilobits. So if you partition a link, even let's say a satellite link or a, you know, a very small channel or over 300 kilobits, whatnot, um, this will work and it will now ship standard with this unit. It's not an add-on, it's just part of it. Um, and it's, it's available for you to use, and you can enter up to 16 X-Gen IP addresses in, in this configuration. Uh, that allows you to fan out up to 16 IP addresses, but you can also configure it in broadcast mode and uh, address any X-Gen on your network. So you, let's say if you have a satellite link, you can set it up to broadcast and just you know set up all your downlinks all across a state, all across the country, and uh, have translators or single frequency network nodes listening to that same network stream. And, and that's yeah. an interesting point, not to, not to steal from our webinar, webinar in two weeks, but this does have application in the SFN world. Oh, yes, certainly, exactly. So Because in SFN, you do want to fan out your content to as many nodes or uh, all the nodes in the system, and this allows you to do that. Yep. Okay. Another nice little application that, uh, well, it's, it's not quite ready yet, but it's coming uh, fall this year as a, as a software update. Um, certainly our importers can already do what's called a station logo, uh, but you, you require external automation support to do that. Um, but we have, we'll have a little application in there that will actually uh, take that and simplifies it. And if you don't have the automation support at this time, uh, you can certainly put up a static logo. So you point this application to a 200 by 200 pixel file, like our little Nautel logo here, and you hit send, and you know within 30 seconds to a minute, um, it will appear on a real receiver, shown on a picture here. Um, Could be a certain, car radio or whatever. Exactly. Uh, now, the earlier generations of HD radio receivers only have text-based support. They wouldn't show that, but all of the newer receivers, or I think pretty much most of the newer receivers, would have some sort of graphical support, and many automobiles certainly have it. Great. Uh, coming soon, we'll also uh, support the Optimod PC1101 uh, for your HD2, 3, and 4 audio processing. Um, we don't ship it at this part, point in time, as we have a few things to uh, sort out, but uh, we already have it in the importer. Um, we, we've supported this, this product for in the importer for a long time, had a lot of success with it, and it does a great job processing your HD2, 3s, and 4s, um, but it, it is for the secondary audio only. Another interesting solution that we've come across here, um, uh, coming as well, is the, uh, a solution that can also process the HD1. Now, what's different about the HD1 from your secondaries is that you want to process both the FM and the HD1 in the same processor, if at all possible. So that when a receiver blends from the FM to the HD1, it sounds the same. Um, you don't want it to be sounding completely different um, or be you know, different in time, different level, whatnot. So the best solution is to have it all processed in one system. So Sound4 has a PCI Express card that does exactly that. Um, you plug in your studio feed, a single studio feed, and it will break it out into two feeds, one that will directly go into the exporter, which is now in the same box that could house this card, or it can um, 
uh, feed your transmitter over an MPX connection um, or to the, out, to the outside here. So that, that's a very neat little solution here. And you talk about stable diversity delay. What does that infer? Well, it, you know, it's, it's certainly always a concern that when you add all of these cards or different components together, in the end of the day, if you string all of these various system components together, will the delay still be stable? Um, so when you blend from the FM to the HD, you want to be within, you know, a very short or close amount of time so that it, it's a seamless blend to the listener. Right. Okay. Um, and we've made sure this card does do that. Um, you know, we've tested in the lab, and uh, we can certainly say that it does it. Great. Okay. Um, interesting as well is, you know, um, since we're on an open platform, a Windows-based platform, it's pretty straightforward to install things like uh, PC, PC clients for the Axia Livewire and whatnot. And, um, um, you know, moving forward, I think there will be lots of partnerships, let's say, with, with Omnia or other partners as well, that can provide a number of software products on the system. That's why we built in the headroom to allow for things like audio processing for your secondaries right on, on, on the main processor, not requiring any add-in cards. Both, um, both audio processing as well as what we might call pre-processing that takes maximum advantage of the, um, of the digital link. Exactly, exactly. I can also see playout system coming along here. Um, you know, it's 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 an open system, so we we want to see where we can take this in the future. Yep, yep. So we'll be working with our EcoSphere partners to improve the uh, the the capabilities of what could be built right into this box. Right. Now we certainly also want to listen to our customers to see what would be good solutions for this for this product. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. Tell us about the importer as a standalone. Well, certainly, you know, having the import and export combined, as we've talked about so far, is certainly a, a, a good a good solution for many installations. But it's not for all installations. Let's say if you wanted to keep your importer back in a studio, um, and let's say you've got a license 950 unidirectional STL, whatnot. Um, well, well, in that case, it would make sense to keep the exporter back at the site. But let's say you wanted to keep or back at the studio. But if you want to keep the exporter at the site, we can separate them. Like I said before, we're not discontinuing the exporter plus. It still feel, uh, um, fits uh, a, a number of use cases. Um, so we'll keep that at the site if you want. So you can have just the importer by itself at the studio. And it will pretty much give you all the secondaries just the same. So it is your choice as to whether you want to have combined or separated. Okay. At this point, I think Phil will uh, will switch over and go live to an uh, importer exporter and a multicast plus importer exporter. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you see a Phil's screen and work directly with him on this. There we go. Okay. So we've got our screen here. Uh, as you can see, it's a standard uh, Windows desktop here. So I'll just walk you through the different software components that we have on here. So starting uh, with the um, Here's our GPS receiver. So you can see right now I've got a GPS antenna hanging out of our window. It's picking up seven satellites right now. Um, and uh, it's got an HDOP, which is the horizontal dilution of uh, precision, I believe, of 1.4, which is, is very good. And the reason why we want to have a very good uh, satellite fix is that you want to have good location resolution in order to get precise time. Um, and you can see down below, we've got the latitude and longitude and our time. Um, and that will then, in, in the end, drive the one pulse per second that I've mentioned earlier, which then kicks our 10 megahertz oscillator, which then creates a 44 one, and uh, which will then lead into our audio card. So here is the, uh, the new control interface for the uh, Lynx card. So I've got four audio streams set up here for HD1, HD2, HD3, HD4. And the important thing to notice here, this header field here, that's our interconnect from our GPS card to the Lynx card. And you can see we're creating a 44.1 kilohertz clock, and it's using that to discipline all of the audio rates within that audio card. So the important thing then to note is that the source of your current time synchronization is not the card's internal clock, but the one that it finds on the header which will then drive all the sample rate converters down here. And even though we're feeding it with a 44.1 source, it's not precisely 44.1. It, you know, it's whatever the other system's running on. And these sample rate converters make sure that it's disciplined to, to GPS 
before being passed on to the uh, control application in the importer and the exporter. Which now leads us into the next application here. So here is the screenshot of the uh, new software that um, um, is the control application. Uh, it looks a little bit different than previous uh, importer software, but uh, you know, a lot, you'll recognize a lot of the same kind of concepts. So the SysUI is sort of the, your main control screen here that um, where you can configure the destination IP address to the XGen and um, uh, it gives you a little bit of an indication as to how, whether the system's running or not. So let's say if you stop, you can see um, the, red, the lights are red and it allows you to configure your HD radio service mode, the iBox service mode. You can configure your MP1 to MP3s and there's a number of pre-configured options. Uh, you can see whether if you want to take two secondaries, uh, three secondaries, uh, various splits, and any of the presets that are called AE are uh, already pre-configured for artist experience. So that makes it a lot easier to get on air with uh, artist experience and show all your album art um, as you're uh, transmitting your music. So let's hit run again and you can see it transitions back to green. And at that point we can see the other Here's all the other audio clients, so here's HD2, um, and we have to reconnect it because we stopped it. Uh, you can see it's, it's pointing to the second channel on the links card, and you can also optionally have it play out as for a conference monitor or whatnot on, on, the, on the links card here as well. You can see the bouncing bars, you can see that your, level, your audio level should be somewhere in midpoint here and stay stable in the long run. Um, and uh, so all that is fine and good. So we got also HD4, which ought to restart it, and HD3 as well. They all ought to restart it here as well. Same kind of idea. They just it's a different audio stream, different uh, side channel, um, same concept. Now we haven't got any automation equipment hooked up right now, but if it was, you could see the last program service data, the song, artist, title, um, show up on here. So we can double check that all of that stuff is working right. Um, so that's in essence the the remote UI or the, the local UI. That's uh, a lot I've, simpler than the systems were in the past. Well, yes, I, I think they, they made it simpler too. A lot of the the more detailed configuration settings are sort of under the hood uh, that don't necessarily need to be set. And yeah. it's nice to have all the the um, number of presets that are already pre built for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't envision uh, too many customers having to. Uh, you know, set up their own presets. I think the presets that are in there will likely will just work for them. So, uh, looking at the web interface here, um, uh, it comes with a pre-built web interface here, and you see most of the same configurations here. Uh, you can see here, for example, the system configuration and see whether the HD2, 3, and 4 should just start up automatically. And uh, being forward-thinking, of course, they've enabled up to eight service streams. Um, the communication tab is very similar to the, the, the main screen that we had earlier, where you can configure your service mode, you know, your basic status information. Um, here's what's sort of new that you wouldn't have seen in the importer, and it's the basic embedded exporter configuration. A lot of these configurations were essentially available in the embedded exporter, but now they're in here as well. So for example, you would set your country code and your FCC ID at this level now, where previously those would have been set in the, the exporter um, itself. This is where you configure your call sign, um, your station logo, um, and uh, a lot of these sort of things. You configure your program service type. The MPS, which stands for Main Program Service, uh, that's where you configure where your main audio is coming from. And just like we had the other ones pointed earlier to channels 2, 3, and 4, well, we use channel 1 in this case. Um, and uh, we, can, we also have the optional output device to uh, conference monitor the output of, of, of your audio. Program service data, PSD, uh, allows you to set a number of things from our uh, comments. Um, all these things used to be in the exporter. Now they're in here, much the same. Now in our software, we've got a separate GUI utility for the, uh, the time synchronization module. Um, so it, I would use, instead, you know, use the um, our GPS system here. That gives you all the information here instead. The ADD is the analog diversity delay. 
this is where you set up the uh, amount of delay that on the analog audio and you tell it which audio device uh, you want to use for that. Right now it's running so I can't choose it, but you could choose another um, channel on the links card for the input and output. And it essentially you program the delay in 44.1 kilohertz samples. Um, so right now it's set to 281,000 samples. There's also a ramp rate. So let's say when you start the system up, it comes up with uh, zero delay or very low latency delay. Um, and as as it will slowly build up delay. So a setting of 100, I think, takes around 15 minutes to build up an eight and a half second delay. Um, but you can you can play with the rate as to how fast or how slow you want uh, that ramp to be. So let's say if you're going back into a live broadcast for a sporting event, whatnot, um, you can ramp that back down and uh, and change that. All right, so that's most of this. Um, so maybe only a few things to highlight here. Um, I can bring up the uh, task manager here a little bit, and we can look at um, you know some of the performance here. And right now it's running a little bit higher just because of the, the webinar as well, but you can see there's lots of headroom um, in our processor. Um, and, and this is both the importer and exporter in one box, and it's still running. And right. doing a webinar with the GoToWebinar application, and it's still running 17% CPU utilization. Yes, and four audio streams all at the same time, That's uh, awesome. along, along with all the GUIs and all the, uh, the things on there as well. That's right. right. Very good. Okay. All right, so let me turn it back to you, Chuck. All right. And we'll bring this down here. And hopefully you can see the screen again. We'll go down. And this, all everything we've been talking about is completely compatible with our GV series, which, of course, is designed for digital radio right from the get-go, which operates from 3.5 kilowatts, or is op is, there are options for 3.5 kilowatt up through 88 kilowatts. Um, and they are digital, efficient, uh, intelligent, refined, and the X-Gen can be built right in. So basically what you need to do HD is one of these importer exporters and, and a, a GV with the X-Gen built in, and you're good to go. Um, and the big news is at NAB this year, we announced that we've done some work. Our engineers have been working in the background, continuous improvement, and we made it possible for uh, MV lights which were originally sold as analog-only transmitters, uh, back a couple of years, we made some upgrades. And uh, from, a, from a couple of years back and further toward the future, i.e. currently, um, those are now upgradable to HD radio. We have to replace uh, an exciter in there with one that supports adaptive pre-correction. But apart from that, the transmitter is compatible with HD radio, and uh, it has the same specifications and functions of the GV. Um, there are considerations for exciter configurations. It does require a software upgrade and a new exciter up hardware upgrade, and it'll be up available in Q3 of this year. Uh, talk to either your uh, Nautel salesperson or Nautel customer service, and they will ask you questions and make sure that your MV light is compatible and you'll be able to do the upgrade to, uh, to HD radio. The other big change that we've made is that VSHD, which is the device that will upgrade a, one of the VS units, either the VS300 or the VS1 or the VS2.5 to digital, uh, is now coming with HD Power Boost as standard, which provides up to 25% more FM plus HD power and simultaneously provides up to 5% higher AC to RF efficiency. So this is a, a big improvement. And it's now available. Just contact customer service for the activation code, and it's available at no cost. So this is continuous improvement. This is adding features to your VS series uh, that you didn't even have before, and, and we're very proud of that. Um, this, I love this graphic. Phil, can you explain what this is, and let's talk about the relevance to this discussion? Well, I like to do little animations here and there. It's kind of kind of fun to do. Um, but, yeah, single frequency networks for HD radio is, is, is a neat topic. So this little animation here shows you a main booster sort of emitting a wave front, uh, a booster, smaller power transmitter on the right-hand side. It just shows you where in you know, your geography the two wave fronts meet. So those are sort of the equal delay lines. Um, if you don't want to know more about this topic, I'll certainly talk more about this in an upcoming webinar. 
Um, but the big attraction for HD radio and single frequency networks is that we can demonstrate that you can actually, if with the appropriate planning, uh, and that is important, we can demonstrate a seamless handoff from one transmitter to the next. So the, your HD radio won't skip a beat, so to speak. Uh, so as if, you we drive, from a, if we drive from the primary coverage area to the booster coverage area, the HD radio never loses lock. Exactly, exactly. And unlike analog transmission, where you will have to have some, mitigate some interference concerns, because of the built-in forward air correction in HD radio, the, the listener won't know a difference. There is no, you know, as long as it keeps this HD lock, there is no de deterioration in the signal. So and that's, that's, a big, that's a big thing, because in the future, when everything is HD radio, you'll have cellular radio stations, and you'll be able to drive across entire states or regions and have and be listening to the exact same station and never lose lock. Yeah, exactly. For example, along a roadway or whatnot, you could uh, have many smaller transmitters along that roadway and just pass drivers from one to the next, and they won't even know the difference. The other thing that we're going to talk about in two weeks' time, and do register for this webinar because it's going to be great, but the other thing we're going to talk about is some improvements that have actually been made in doing an SFN for analog because it's actually more difficult to make a great analog SFN than it is a digital SFN. Exactly. We'll have a couple of options there as well. Okay. Very good. I think we've explained that. So to summarize, and we're coming right in on time, um, to summarize, uh, we've introduced a new multicast combined importer-exporter and another importer only. And uh, by doing it combined, it simplifies the installation, becomes very versatile, and becomes more cost effective. So we can actually reduce the implementation cost of HD radio. Uh, there's a new HD upgrade path for the MV light, and we can take advantage of HD reliable transport, uh, the MER uh, measurement tool, asymmetrical sidebands, and we're going to push the HD radio boundaries with HD SFN research and with the all new HD multiplex where you could actually have in the in the grand future where where all the receivers are already HD, you could actually have up to 15 radio stations on a single FM transmitter. So that's, that's when we shut off the analog and use every bit of the bandwidth and more for for HD bandwidth. And that way we can have up to 15 stations. Imagine what could happen if, if each FM station were able to have 15 content channels. I'll just leave that there and let you dream. And all of that's supported by the very best customer service team in the entire industry. I have no doubt what makes Nautel go is the unbelievable reliability and the support after the sale that uh, Nautel's customer service provides. Now we're going to go to your questions, and I'm going to do my best to uh, answer them all, but we'll see. We may have answered some. So there's a lot of car radios out there with... Uh, HD on it. What can we do to encourage manufacturers to make a tabletop and component sets? That's a good point, uh, mm -hmm. Ray. Thank you for that. Uh, right now, I think that an awful lot of the stations are are focusing on the automobile environment, but you're right. Uh, there are a number of tabletop and component manufacturers, uh, but they're not as many as they used to be. They're certainly focusing on the automobile environment. Good question, um, and, and that needs to be addressed. Um, it talked about the Axia LiveWire interface, talked about uh, having the Orban cards. Uh, uh, it says, is it only for the NV Lite or will it also work with the NV? The, actually, the NV was developed for HD radio from the get-go. So um, there's no problem with adapting a, uh, an NV series transmitter if you have them uh, for this product. Um, how much is that new PC cord that has processor for both HD1 and HD2? Uh, talk to your Nautel salesperson, and they can give you all the pricing uh, uh, details. Uh, and agreed. Uh, Sean Mattingly says, uh, we need local stores to have HD radios on their shelves. I found some. I make it a point personally every time I go into a Best Buy or something like that, to, or a Fry's if I'm lucky enough, and, and, and talk to the departmental manager and see if we can see more HD receivers in there and show interest. And in some cases, I've bought all the HD radio receivers in that particular store um, just because and I'll sell them or give them my friends or whatever. So what's the simplest and most economical way to add HD capability to my VS300? All right, David, what you'll do is you'll add the uh, VSHD, which 
basically replaces the internal VS exciter with one that, it, that handles adaptive pre-correction, so it linearizes the transmitter, and then you'll add in the new multiplex, H, uh, HD multiplex plus import or exporter, and that's the way to do that. Uh, how much bandwidth do I need for an e to, e to XSTL? You mentioned that's 300 and something kilobits, right, Bill? Yeah, exactly. That, that's the maximum. Um, like the actual bandwidth is lower than that, but you don't want to, yeah, you want to have a little bit of headroom. So if you partition 300 kilobits, you should be fine. Okay. Well, that's the questions we've come up with, um, and we've, we've managed to answer them. I, I do suggest if you have interest in these kinds of technologies, make sure you're signed up for our Nautel Waves newsletter. Uh, you can find this webinar and all of the other webinars we've done, I think there's probably 50 or 60 of them, online on our website. Um, and, and you can also uh, check in with us on YouTube and watch a lot of things there, as well as uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. We're on all of those places. So I uh, want to thank everybody for being a part of uh, this webinar today. In, in, a, in a day, this webinar will be available to watch if you didn't catch it all. You're welcome to email me as well. I'm Chuck Kelly, and Phil, thanks very much. This has been fun. All right. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. For Phil Schmidt, I'm Chuck Kelly, thanking you for being with us today. Bye-bye for now.